After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. The story of Christmas has all the makings of a great drama. It's an incredible story, but it's more of a James Bond movie than a Hallmark movie. There's this picture, not only of the innocence and the beauty of a child, but of the war that's going on, the spiritual cosmic battle between God and Satan. And this is Operation Emmanuel, where God has sent himself to become one with us as human beings, to provide not only the picture of who God is, the invisible, incredible creator of the universe has become flesh, has become meat. We talked about that word incarnation. And in the counterattack, Satan tries to stir up Herod and the, the disbelief of the religious group that were leading the country at the time and trying to snuff out the life of the Savior before he ever gets started. And you realize that we see the story often through kind of smarmy Christmas carols and nice Christmas cards, and it it wasn't a silent night, and it didn't smell great, and it wasn't this hallmark ending. It was a battle, and it's the battle for the hearts and lives of billions of people that continues to this day. Last week, we looked at the shepherds and how they were lowly and uneducated, and they were local, they were right nearby, and they got invited to not only witness the brand new baby Jesus, but to become the ambassadors to tell first about him, to become the envoys. So they were the emphasis that Jesus was coming in humility. And whether you know it or not, the first four books in the New Testament, the Gospels, each have a different viewpoint and a different audience. The reason that there are different things in different Gospels is because they're telling a little different story. And Luke is presenting him as fully human, that he was the son of Adam, that he was human. And therefore, the stories of his birth and the stories of the shepherds and the humility and the lowliness. Matthew is preaching to a Jewish audience, and he's presenting him as the king of the Jews. And so he tells the story of Gentile envoy They are 
actually statesmen from a foreign country who come and kneel before the king and bow and present gifts. Because even though he came in a lowly way, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So you have the shepherds and you have the magi. And they were on different pay scales. They were, on different gen- they were from gif- different countries. They were from different orientations completely. And so I want us to look at the same story, the familiar story, and to look at it a little differently through the lens of the Magi. That in Matthew 2, where we just read as we listened to the film clip, it said, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, and Magi, or as was traditionally translated, wise men, came from the east to Jerusalem. And they said, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. There is a story behind the story. These guys show up on the scene, and obviously there's a whole lot of questions about who are the Magi and where did they come from. And one of the questions I also want you to wrestle with as we walk through the scriptures is who am I most like in the Christmas story? Which one is telling the story of not only where I am generally, but where I am right now? And the Magi had searched for a long journey, probably somewhere near 800 miles they had come. And they had come with gifts and with hope that they were going to find a miracle of God. They were going to find something that was going to be epic and life-changing. And so they came. Why would they come? Well, we get a little clue from the text that said they were following a star. But I don't know if you've thought this through in real time. If you see a new star in the sky, do you automatically board a plane and go to Israel and look for a baby? It's like, what's the connection? How would they have known? So let me, let me fill in a few blanks for you, and some of it's suppositional. We're not sure how this is, but here's some likely possibilities. The Magi had an incredible heritage. They actually were a small tribe called the Magian tribe, and they've specialized in astrology and in following the the ways to tell what was going to happen in the future, to to kill the the king what day they should do things. And eventually they rose in prominence and power, and they added people around them who could interpret dreams, who could could, uh, advise the kings of the empire. They were obviously a very flexible group because they were a force in the Babylonian and the Assyrian and eventually the Persian and then finally the Parthian. So no matter what the political climate was, this was a group that retained a great deal of power. Now, be careful not to get your theology from Christmas carols because the song goes, we three kings of Orient are, right? Well, they probably weren't three. There were probably lots more than that and they probably came with not three lonely guys on camels, but probably with a, a whole group of soldiers and they were bringing a, a contingency from a foreign nation and it says they were kings. They were not kings. In fact, if we could be more accurate, they're probably king makers. They were the ones that helped decide who the succession was for the next king. They at times deposed kings and helped set up others. So they were the, the forces behind the throne, if you will. And then it says of Orient, and that they didn't come from China, as we often think of the Orient. They, they came from the area where today would be Iran. And so they came seeking a king. And they asked a question, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? Now, how would they have known anything about this tiny little nation of Israel, except that if we go back 600 years in history... There's a character that we know a little bit about, and his name is Daniel. And Daniel was a Hebrew Hebrew royalty, noble, that was taken captive and taken over to Babylon. And it says after he had interpreted the king's dream, the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him, and he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, and he placed him in charge of all its magi. Okay, so this group was 600 years before the time of Christ. And at that point, Daniel, and then as Daniel was elevated, his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all placed in positions of prominence. And several times he saved the king's bacon and he interpreted dreams and he was the one that gave him advice. So Daniel was a highly revered figure in this area of the country. The Magi 
were good at keeping old scrolls and documents, and that was the, often the secret to their power, is they had a whole lot of knowledge and information. And so my guess, my supposition, my educated guess, is that the reason the Magi knew there was something going on in Israel is because Daniel chapter 9 says there's going to one come who is the anointed one, and it gives a general formula from, the, from a point in history about the Israel nation to when the anointed one will be cut off. So if he's going to be cut off at this point, he has to have been born somewhere before that. So I believe they would have known that God was doing something amazing with the nation of Israel, that there would have been a general time frame that they would have known, and if they had access to Daniel, they may have had access to some of the other Old Testament prophets. So they have some background information, and we don't know how much they were followers of God, but let me just tell you, anybody who packs up and travels 800 miles to see what God's showing them to look for tells me that they've got a pretty intent, devoted interest. So they have a little bit of background, and then it says that there was a star. Now let me give you a little historical time frame for this. We talked about the 400 years between the last Old Testament book and the coming of Jesus, and there were lots of things that happened in these so-called silent years. Uh, Alexander the Great takes over the world. His empire is divided up among four generals. The nation of Israel rises up in rebellion and independence, and for a period of time, the Maccabeans were kings of Jewish kings of Israel. And then Rome comes in, and you and I think, well, Rome came and they took over for millennia. But the truth is, is that was the beginning of a big battle between an empire that you know very little about called the Parthian Empire. And the reality is that Rome was coming from the west, and at times it had conquered Palestine and taken over. The Parthian Empire, which is Iran, Persia, the places that were also Babylon and Assyria, the, the eastern area. They were of power and of force here. And then there was also a nation of Armenia up there. But this was the strategic demilitarized zone between these two great empires. And at times, Rome was in control. And at times, Parthia came in and kicked him out and Rome was defeated. And then the Roman Empire came back in. So all I'm saying to, to give you that background is that when they came, they were diplomats from a foreign, hostile nation. So when it says they came in with all their retinue, when it says that all Jerusalem was disturbed, that's why. You understand how a question like, where is the one born king of the Jews, could be a problem. You see, Herod looks down and he looks at his own nameplate and he says, I thought that was my job. I'm king of the Jews. And Herod was a paranoid and violent man who did everything he could to hang on to power. So when foreign envoys come from a hostile nation and they say, where's the next king of the Jews? You can imagine what kind of reaction is kicking off in Herod. And here's this spiritual battle, this epic conflict. So the next reason they came is the star. So you can have a lot of ideas or suppositions about what the star might have been. Let me, let me tell you some of the things that have been suggested. There have been a lot of people who've gone back and looked at the astronomy and said, well, there was a comet at this time or a supernova, and so that perhaps they saw this. And no doubt, the magi, the, the, from where we get the word magician or magic, they, they were very interested in astronomy and astrology. They were very interested in the heavens. There's also a lot of complex formulas about around 4 BC, there could have been these alignment of planets, and it might have looked like this, and it might have said this. My favorite is it could have been a UFO that came and shone a light down on Bethlehem. And you know, no matter what the problem is, there's always an alien solution to it. But if you read carefully what the star was, I think you'll say that it had to have been a unique act of God. Because first of all, it appeared at the right time. And then it says it led them from the east. Well, you and I think straight lines. If you were coming here from the east, we think you came across, straight across. But you don't, cover, you don't go across the desert. You come up around the Fertile Crescent, and then you drop down. So it led them all the way up around, and they came to, first of all, if you're looking for a king, you look at the capital city. So they came to Jerusalem. 
And then it says, after they inquired of Herod, the star led them, and it came on down. And it doesn't just say to the town of Bethlehem. It says it led them to the house where the child was. So that's pretty tough to do for a supernova. It's not too hard for a UFO if you want to believe in such things. <laughs> but the point was, and you think back, this is a little bit of an echo where the children of Israel were led by a pillar of cloud by day. And what were, was it by night? It was a pillar of fire that God was leading in very much the same way to bring them to exactly this moment in history, to exactly this place. And then, of course, it gives power to the birth of Christ and to this Operation Emmanuel that when they come to Jerusalem and they ask Herod, so where is the new king? He turns and he asks his advisors, who are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And they go back into the old scrolls from about 700 years before Christ. And they say, you know, in the book of Micah, he does talk about that. And so our quote here in Matthew 2 is from Micah 5.2. And it says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah... That's because there's two Bethlehems. One's up in the Galilean region. The other one is down just southwest of Jerusalem. Are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. You see, I love the beauty and the power and the proof of how many prophecies were given about who the anointed one, the Messiah, the king that was to come, the shepherd that would shepherd God's people. That all through the Old Testament, there are little hints and glimpses of this hope that was coming. And Jesus is the only possible one who fulfilled even a few of them. And when people say, well, he must have tried to fulfill those prophecies, I always tell them it's very difficult to choose where you're going to be born. That was clearly not on him. He didn't do that intentionally. And if you think about the story, there's, they lived up in Nazareth. They had to travel to Bethlehem just in time for the birth because it was their roots. It was the city of David. It was where both of their families were from. And then they go to Egypt. And so all three, test, all three slight statements from Scripture that he would be called someone from Nazareth, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be called out of Egypt. Somehow God was able to put all of those together in this complex mosaic of fulfilling the prophecies. And so the scripture is incredibly clear. And they listened and they followed. Back to the bigger picture, the cosmic struggle that's going on here. God sends Jesus as the bringer of light into darkness. And John 1 has a very significant statement. It says, And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You see, Christmas is the story not of a sweet baby in a manger that never cries. It's a story of a cosmic struggle between God and Satan for the souls of men. And so in the, in the other corner of the ring, we have Herod. And Herod is the king, and he is at this point being used as a powerful ruler and operating for Satan. He is against Jesus. So Herod responds with great violent reaction, but he cloaks it, he hides it, he, he tries to come across like a good guy. Now let me tell you a little bit about Herod. Herod was half Jewish and half what they call Idiomaean, which means he was from the group of people called the Edomites, who were descendants of Esau. And so the Jewish people considered him a half-breed. They were very, very picky about what your lineage was, and so he wasn't fully Jewish. And he got his power from Rome, so that didn't make him very popular either. In fact, it took him three years to actually attack Jerusalem and win his own capital city. So he was not a popular guy with the Jewish people. So he tried to do things that would cause him to be accepted. So he's called Herod the Great. And he's great partly because he's a great builder. So Herod the Great built a seaport town where there was a tiny little fishing village and it's called Caesarea. And Caesarea was named for the Caesar. 
So he's trying to curry favor with Rome, and it was a magnificent city, which is one of the most impressive ruins yet there today. So he built Caesarea. He built up Masada. He also built and took the, the little temple that Ezra and Nehemiah had reconstructed, and he rebuilt it into a beautiful, huge, magnificent temple where Jesus and the disciples went to worship and to learn. So he was great because he was a builder and because he was seen as highly, he bought favor, shall I say, but inside he was hard and dark and violent and he was insecure. So it says, he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the child and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Let me tell you a little bit about the heart of Herod. He was deathly afraid that somebody would take his rule from him. And so in the course of his rule, in trying to hang on to power, he killed three of his own children, three sons. He killed his favorite wife. He had many. He killed her mother. He killed her grandfather. And he killed his brother-in-law. Somebody said it's safer to be a pig in Herod's house than one of his relatives. And that's really funny if you understand he was Jewish and didn't eat pork. So (laughs) he was a violent, paranoid man trying to hang on to control of his kingdom that was hard fought and barely held on to. And so in that, he uses deception. He says to the Magi, oh, tell me when you find him and we'll come and worship him together. And they probably were were fairly able politicians. They probably knew he was lying the whole time. But then you realize he also responds with great violence, with anger, with insecurity. Why was that? Well, because you see, what had happened is somebody was challenging his control of his kingdom. What was his response? It says, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi because they listened to God and went home a different way, He was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. So again, to put your Christmas card straight, the Magi did not show up at the stable where the manger was. They show up later. We don't know how much later. They show up to a house where the child was. Not called a baby anymore, but a child. So Herod, taking no making sure he's covering the bases, kills all the male children from two years old and down. And you and I think, that's a horrible, how could anybody do that? And I'll just say to you, anybody who could kill three of their own kids would have no trouble killing somebody else's kids. It was part of how he is, his philosophy is holding on to power. So he responds because of this great concern. And you know what the core concern was? The core concern was that the rise of Jesus' power, the rise of Jesus' kingdom might be a threat to my kingdom. Was he right? This was a valid concern. You see, Jesus doesn't come in to share kingship. And I think this is an important point to pause at because I believe you and I have the same battle. That the rise of Jesus' kingdom and to acknowledge him as the King of kings and Lord of lords and to believe that that baby who was in a manger, who was in the home, is indeed the King of kings and Lord of lords and should be worshipped and bowed down to and obeyed. That will threaten your kingdom. You see, you can't have two kings running the same country. You can't have two kings running the same life. And I think this is a powerful picture that these gentlemen who were from a far-off country with really minimal clues left everything they had to go and search for the king so that they could worship in truth. Herod, who was local, who had much more access to truth. In fact, I was thinking about this. Isn't this a strange picture? That the very teachers of the law who looked up in Micah where the child was going to be born didn't go to Bethlehem seven miles away. I would have hitched my wagon right to the Magi's tail, and I'd have followed them down. But the ones who were close, the ones who had lots of information, the ones who knew that Jesus was coming, couldn't be bothered, 
You know why? Because they were still all about their kingdom. I believe there are more people who do not kneel and bow before Jesus, not because they don't believe it's true, but because they don't want to give up control. And if we're honest, that's a huge issue for all of us. I want to do what I want to do, and I want God to like it. In fact, if we're honest, we often want God to be our servant instead of the other way around, don't we? In fact, we, want, we sometimes pray in a demanding way, God, I want you to give me this and I want it now. And so I think this is a great question to say, where am I in this story? Am I somebody who will spare no expense and no output of energy to find out who Jesus is and to bow and to live for him and to let him be the king of my life? Or am I people who are full of knowledge and have understanding in all kinds of different ways, but I can't be bothered to let him run my life because I'm busy with my own thing? You see, I think in this powerful spiritual battle that you see between God and Satan, that you see between Jesus and Herod, I think is played out in every one of our worlds, in every one of our circles of friendship, in every one of our families. That there are people who will seek and find. There are people who will come and acknowledge Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there are many who will celebrate Christmas and will say, isn't this a nice, cute picture? And we'll send Christmas cards to each other and we'll say, Merry Christmas. But we're really still in very invested in my own kingdom. And I think the story has a beautiful moment where these who have sought for so long and come so far, they come and they find what they have been looking for, that God has been drawing them and they by faith have been responding and there's the moment when they find. You know, we call people who are not yet followers of Jesus, we call them seekers and some of them are actively seek them and some of them are just lost. But that moment when you finally see that Jesus is who he says he is, that nobody else has fulfilled the prophecies, that this is real and true, And that you come face to face with the God of the universe in the face of Jesus. And then you have a choice. And there's this epic moment. It says, And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Can you imagine traveling that far, never knowing if you're going to find anything, packing a bunch of gifts for a thing you hoped would happen, and all of a sudden... Their faith was realized. Their hope was fulfilled. And it says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, these statesmen from a foreign country, the Gentiles from around the world, and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's a powerful picture that really is seated all through the, the Scriptures, that God has worked with his chosen people, the Jewish people, And the nation of Israel has a special place in God's heart. But all the way through the story, there have been Gentiles who have found the king. And we don't know how much they knew, but they knew enough to get them here. You see, it doesn't take much information. In fact, I find again and again, it's not the people with the most information who respond with greatest faith. Sometimes it's people with minimal information. They have no church background. They have no family that came to church. They didn't have much, but they have a a thirst and a hunger for knowing who God is. And they come and they find Him and their lives are changed forever. And there are kids that grow up in the church and hear the story every year and hear stories after stories after stories and they walk away and they become the kings and queens of their own kingdoms. You see, it's it's a journey that comes by faith and it involves surrender. It involves worship. It involves bowing down before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and saying, you are going to be my God. My thoughts and my attitudes and my actions are under your supervision. I bow to you. And what happens when we worship is we desire to give. Somebody said once, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And isn't that true? And I know a lot of the Christmas giving is out of obligation, but there's something bound up in our hearts when when we love somebody, we want to do nice things for them. We want to give. And, and they came, and it says that they not only brought worship, which was their best gift, they brought 
gold and frankincense and myrrh. And you and I understand what gold is, but you may be surprised if I tell you that the frankincense and the myrrh that they gave to Jesus was worth far more than the gold. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you're trying to survive, gold is not very helpful. You can't eat it, doesn't keep you warm, not really much use except as a looks nice. Frankincense and myrrh were gifts that were reserved for kings, for priests, for high officials. It were the essential elements in the incense that was offered before God. They were essential elements in the spices they used in anointing a body for death. And what you may not realize is they also had medicinal impact. In fact, they've gone back and rediscovered. Frankincense and myrrh were valuable because they were both beneficial and rare. And they came from the area that's today Oman. And interestingly enough, the Parthian kingdom was on the Silk Road between the Han Dynasty in China and the Roman emperor over here. And so they traded in things from both directions, but they also had their things that were valuable. And there are two different trees that if you cut the bark, the sap comes out and it hardens and it becomes a crystallized sap. And one of them produces frankincense and the other produces myrrh. And they were gifts of royalty. They were gifts of great value. In fact, we know from the fact that when Joseph and Mary came to the temple, they offered the gifts for the purification of their son of two doves, which was the sacrifice for poor people. We know Joseph and Mary were poor. What you may not realize out of this story is they suddenly became rich. This poor family received gold and frankincense and myrrh. And not only was it a symbol of the worship of these foreign dignitaries, not only was it a a beautiful outpouring of their treasure to Jesus, it was a way, I believe, in which God provided for them I think this is a beautiful picture. Sometimes we don't see stories as real people. But you think about it. Joseph left his job in Nazareth. They came down and they stayed some time in Bethlehem. They probably had family there. That was, the, you know, the roots that they came from, uncles and aunts and grandparents or whoever. And then God warns him in a dream. His spy network was highly efficient. He says, Herod's going to try to kill the babies. So you need to run. How does a poor itinerant family go down and live in Egypt where he has no basis for his business. And you know what I think the answer is? Gold and frankincense and myrrh. And not only were they beautiful gifts of sacrifice and treasure given to the king, they were also God's way of providing. Because the next stage in their journey was a process of them obeying God and going back by a different way. And I believe that The treasure of our time and the treasure of our talents and the treasure of obedience is like a sweet smell to God. This is a little bit of myrrh, and it smells beautiful. And they burned it in in the worship of God in the temple. And it says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. You see, what we have in the story of Christmas is the story of an epic battle, the story of not good and evil, but God and Satan, the story of God sending light into darkness to bring peace and salvation and forgiveness for sins, and Herod trying to snuff him out because he's hanging on to what little control he has. And the irony is is that Herod didn't last but a couple more years. He couldn't possibly hang on to something that's not really yours. And you know what? When we try to be God, we are very bad at it. We are woefully unprepared for the control we try to hang on to. And out of that story comes Jesus, who was born, who grew up, who not only told us about God and explained to us how to relate to God, but he gave his life on the cross and his sacrifice. And I said to you last week, I think that the sacrifice of the manger was as great as the sacrifice of the cross. That coming into human form and being welded to a human form for eternity was a great sacrifice. And when he gave his life for us and then when he was raised from the dead, it proves that everything he said, everything he came to do was accomplished. That in this battle, 
Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered hell. Jesus conquered Satan. And you and I are left with the same question. Where are you in the Christmas story? Are you a seeker who's got a little information and you need to know more and maybe at the sentimental time of Christmas you've come to church and you're interested in finding out about this Jesus? Let me encourage you to continue seeking till you find. To come to that moment where you bow and you acknowledge Jesus. And I think it's easy for us to get jaded. I love this verse from last week where it says, And Mary treasured all these things in her heart. Don't you think that when she was handling the difficulties of watching Jesus be crucified, all of these things helped her hold on to the fact that God was still at work and doing something amazing? So where are you in the story? Are you seeking? Are you bowing? Are you offering your time and your talents and your treasures and your life in an ever-increasing process as you surrender to the King of Kings? Or are you trying to hang on to your own kingdom to your own destruction. Let me tell you, the story of Christmas is the story of an epic battle that continues to today, and you and I are participants in that. I'm going to hand off to our campus in Green, our campus in South Umqua, and as you guys walk through these last couple of uh, steps, I love you guys. I want you to wrestle with that question As you look back at your life over the last month, over the last year, have you been the one holding the reins? Have you been the one that's trying to keep in control of everything? Or have you been bowing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And I acknowledge that some of you may be seekers. Some of you may not have come to that point of commitment yet. And I, I say you're welcome. This is a great place to be. We'd love to tell you about Jesus. We'd love to help you see that he's more than a baby in a manger that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he's the only hope we have to have a relationship with God the Father. And if you're struggling with that right now, with all the expectations, with all the busyness, with all the things going on in your life, let me encourage you to take some time to kneel. Take some time away from the frenetic schedule. Take some time away from all the expectations that you put on yourself and that other people put on you. And take time to worship. Maybe it's coming to church and being a part of our celebrations. Maybe it's just taking some time alone with the scriptures. And again, asking God, where is it that I am not letting you be in charge of the, not, not letting you be the king? And surrender again to let him be the king. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for how you have entered space-time history, and that you moved people all over the planet. But only a few came to acknowledge you. Only a few were overjoyed. Only a few received light instead of darkness. And God, the same is true today. There are many who wander all around the edge of the light, but they never come in. And Father, I pray for those seekers, that they may be finders, that they may become worshipers, I pray for those of us who have knelt that we would confess that when we take back control that we are trying to play God and that we would again surrender to you. And even God, as we spend a few moments here just worshiping with some more Christmas carols, help their words to penetrate us, to think about what it means and what the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh are in our lives that we could lay down at your feet and offer to you. Help this time of Christmas worship to be a great foundation for a new year where you are working in our lives more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.